Hi everybody, I'm Matt, and I'm here to talk to you today about the science of biogas systems and how to build your own small anaerobic digester. This video is intended to show you if you wanted to do your own small-scale project or even a research project, how you would go about doing that with inexpensive equipment. Biogas is a gas that's produced when microbes decompose organic materials in the absence of oxygen. And biogas is made up of methane and carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. So I'll put those on the board here. So uh, for biogas to burn, and that's our goal, is to have a burnable energy source, uh, we need to have about 60% methane. So uh, we might see in a, a typical biogas analysis, like about 60% here, or even better sometimes, 39% CO2 and 1% H2S. Now CO2 is inert, it doesn't burn, uh, it just goes through the system if you're combusting biogas. Uh, hydrogen sulfide um, is corrosive, it's also toxic to people, so we want to be really careful with H2S. Hydrogen sulfide is the part of biogas that smells like uh, eggs or sulfur. So, biogas is produced by the process called anaerobic digestion, which is uh, when organic materials are decomposed in the absence of oxygen, no oxygen. So uh, when we have an anaerobic system, uh, then microbes will process uh, materials through a different pathway than uh, aerobic systems. So you and I, we breathe air, we like to breathe oxygen, that's how we uh, do our respiration. Uh, and microbes will also respire with oxygen, but in the absence of oxygen, certain groups of microbes can decompose materials uh, through different metabolic pathways. We might call this fermentation. And in particular today, we're looking for methanogenesis, which is the generation of methane from organic substrates. Okay, uh, so typical feedstocks for an anaerobic digester will be, what I'm saying is organic materials. They don't have to be certified organic like your food, but just uh, things that will break down through natural decomposition. So typical feedstocks for an anaerobic digester will be things like manure, um, and then uh, food waste, this could be from your kitchen, from your cafeteria, uh, even from your town. So food waste is great. Uh, you can also use cooking oil, so things like vegetable oil, fryer oil. Uh, we are also working with milk and uh, brewer spent grain. After beer is made, Brewer's grain is left over and it proves to be a, a good energy source for biogas systems as well. All right, so now we're going to talk about the process of anaerobic digestion, what's going on inside an anaerobic digester. I have here on the board a diagram, and this is one type of anaerobic digester. Uh, imagine, if you will, like a big tank, or even uh, we have one at the farm that's like a sausage. Um, so on the one end, we've got an inlet. And here's where we would put our food. So uh, the feed, remember this is our cow manure, our food waste, etc. And what's going in here, if you think about it, is energy in the feed and nutrients. So that's going in there and there's plenty of nutrients in there. We're going to mix those things with water uh, so that it's kind of dilute like a soup uh, or a thin soup and uh, have it flow into the digester as a liquid. We call it a slurry. And then we've got a sealed container, so there's no air coming in, just liquids are coming in here, as we feed. Um, and then as that stuff comes in, on the other side, we've got to have a, a place for it, uh, that to come out. And so after it's been processed, it will come out this way through an outlet pipe uh, as effluent. And you can imagine, uh, if I was to add over here some material, uh, then I'm going to have some effluent flowing out the other end into a waiting tank to really hold it. Well, we're going to want to put a, way, a place for our biogas to get out of the system. So let's put a little port up here. As, um, as the microbes that are in our digester eat the food and the, the uh, manure, they're going to make little bubbles of gas. Little bubbles of gas, and they're going to rise up through the liquid and form in this top layer up here. We have a gas layer. So if we put a pipe or a tube coming out of there. And this will go to our gas storage tank. 
a couple things that are important. We want to keep our digester warm. The microbes that are going to do our digestion are, uh, in our case, they're coming from the belly of a cow. Cows are about uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit body temperature. So a typical uh, operating temperature for what's called a mesophilic digester, which is in the mid-range of uh, happy microbes, is going to be about 95 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly about 35 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty common. Uh, our experiment that we're running right now is running at 35 degrees Celsius. Now the digester can vary in temperature a little bit. Um, at the farm our, our digester is just in a greenhouse and it will go up and down in temperature but it works best when it's nice and warm like this. As it cools off in the fall the digester will slow down because the microbial process slows down um, and it will actually go dormant until it wakes up again in the spring and gets warmer. Uh, in a research environment, we try to keep the temperature as constant as possible to keep the microbial community really stable. Okay, so two things happen in the digester. The first part is, as our food comes in, and we can imagine like, let's say a banana peel in here, and uh, perhaps a, um, an apple core. Okay, my art is terrible, sorry. Uh, the first thing that's going to happen is what's called hydrolysis. And this is where a certain group of microbes called acetogens will start to attack these food particles and break them down into simpler compounds. And they go from uh, complex food to organic acid. This might be acetic acid, for example. And as they do that, uh, they're going to produce CO2. And these guys are called acetogens. So there's one group of microbes that's going to break down the food into uh, acids. All right, the next group of microbes is called methanogens. And these are archaea. It's like bacteria. They're, they're another simple microbe, uh, but they're not bacteria, they are archaea. Uh, and methanogens take the organic acids and they make methane and simpler compounds. That's how we get our biogas is both a combination of carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, and this is where the money is, right? We can't burn carbon dioxide, but we can burn methane for energy. So the methanogenesis part is really important. We need to allow these guys time to do their work, to uh, convert the acids into methane. Um, if we overwhelm the digester by feeding it too fast, uh, or um, if we disturb the community by like really messing with the temperature, uh, then the methano methanogenic community can actually decline and they won't keep up with the acid production over here. Uh, so one of the challenges if we overfeed our digester is uh, we can get too much acid buildup, not enough methane generation, and the digester can get sour. So our pH will decline and we get an acid condition that's hard to recover from. Um, there are ways we can add a buffer or some, something to um, uh, bring it back to, towards a neutral pH. The methanogens like to be about pH 7. That's ideal. Really in the 6 to 8 range is okay. Um, but uh, these guys, if we're not careful, the acetogens can quickly um, convert our, our digester pH down into like even pH 5, 4.5 of C. So, um, it's not really that hard, but we do want to be careful not to overfeed the digester so we don't overstimulate our acetogenic community before the methanogenic community can keep up. So there's a, a process in here where we've got two different types of microbes, and they are doing uh, two steps of the process to convert our complex food into simpler organic acids, and from simpler organic acids into very simple compounds and methane. Okay, so what comes out here is these simpler organic compounds, and these are good as nutrients. Okay, and this can be used as fertilizer. Well, the energy that came in with our uh, original feedstock, that's gonna go out as the biogas. Okay, so gas storage. Remember up here we've got CH4, our methane, and our CO2, and there's a lot of energy wrapped up in that CH4, so we can convert that into useful forms like heat uh, for cooking or electricity if we run it in an engine generator.
that. So this is just an example of an anaerobic digester. This would be called a batch digester. And uh, if you look inside there, you'll see a slurry. This is cow manure and uh, brewer's grain and water. Um, and maybe you can see or you can at least imagine little tiny bubbles of gas uh, being formed uh, as the microbes work on this stuff and the gas bubbles are going to float up the top and here you can actually see a, a little bit of a gas layer trapped in this scum of organic materials on top. A couple things that are interesting here is one, we want to be careful not to make our mixture too thick or else we get a lot of that scum layer and as gas has evolved it will push the scum layer up and it can clog our gas outlet pipe. Um, the other thing to note is uh, that see it's actually a pretty thin slurry. Uh, microbes are going to be doing their job here and breathing out little bubbles of gas. Over time, those small bubbles make a lot of volume of gas and that is what we will use uh, to do our stuff. There are different types of digesters and they can all be pretty easy to build with uh, readily available parts. So the first type is called a batch digester and in a batch digester, uh, something like this or even like this, uh, in a batch digester, you would add a mixture of uh, manure and other materials and water to the digester one time, put a cap on it, and have a gas pipe coming out and collect the gas that's made while you keep this warm for about 25 or 30 days. Uh, the other type is called a continuous flow digester. And in a continuous flow unit, we're going to be adding something uh, every day or every couple days and having some waste come out the other end every couple days. Um, so two types of continuous flow digesters are the plug flow and plug flow. Uh, we can imagine like a big sausage or a tube with an inlet on one end and an outlet on the other. Uh, and we might imagine that it will put in a little bit of stuff here and it'll take a while for it to get to the other end and come out as effluent. Uh, that gives the microbes time to work on it. Uh, the other type is called a full mix or a, a completely stirred tank reactor. Uh, and a full mix digester, um, oftentimes these are what's on farms. They're um, uh, cylindrical tanks with a dome over the top, and they have a mixture of some type, type inside, like a uh, propeller or uh, pumps to mix things. Uh, in a full mix digester, again, we're going to be adding some materials on one side and having uh, some effluent coming out at the same time on the other side. So a couple of useful operating parameters to understand if you're running a digester is um, how much solids is going in is really important. So we're going to look at what's called uh, percent total solids. So percent solids is uh, measured by taking a fresh sample of material um, and then uh, weighing it and then drying it at 105 degrees Celsius overnight and then weighing it again and uh, determining the loss on drying. So if we imagine we have uh, uh, the dry weight um, and then multiply that by a hundred we can get percent total solids. So let's imagine if we had a, um, a uh, mixture of cow manure and water and um, if you picture this cow manure and water here uh, you know, there's water in there, uh, and that doesn't count towards the solids, and then there's cow manure fibers. Those are what the microbes are going to eat and turn into biogas. So, uh, let's say we took this and we weighed it, for starters, and it weighed uh, 100 grams. And then we dry it overnight at 105 degrees Celsius, and now it weighs... Um, smaller material, it weighs 20 grams. So if we take our fresh weight, put that on the, on the uh, bottom of the fraction, 100 grams, and our dry weight on the top there, times 100%. So now we've got 20% solids. So, uh, we talked about total solids. Uh, typically, in a digester, uh, we're going to be going for about 5 to 10 percent total solids as a target. So, 5 to 10 percent. So, uh, if we get much over 10 percent, the slurry can get too thick and we can uh, have problems with uh, 
slurry not flowing properly through the pipes, uh, especially if we have small pipes like in the smaller digester. Uh, you can really have a problem with plugging of small pipes like this. Um, the other problem we can get if we have, we're too aggressive with solids, we can get crusting. So we get a, uh, a scum layer on the top uh, that's full of solids. As gas is produced, it can push that scum layer up and foul your gas pipe. On the other hand, if we get too thin, so less than 5% solids, uh, the solids are what becomes the biogas. So the microbes have to eat something, and uh, they're going to be eating uh, the solids in the feed. They don't eat water. Uh, so uh, if we don't have enough solids in there, then it's not going to be a problem for our digester, but we'll get less gas production. And so if you consider like, now this is just a simple lab bottle, but if we build a big anaerobic digester, we invested you know hundreds or thousands of dollars in that, we want to make sure that we're kind of maximizing our flow through to get the most uh, return on our investment. Typically, they run around between like 5 and 10% solids. So, in an anaerobic digester, uh, the microbes are going to consume some of those solids and convert them into biogas and you know, otherwise simplify them. So, uh, let's imagine that we have a slurry coming in. It's uh, on our input side, we've got about 5% total solids. Uh, and then on our outlet side, the microbes do their work here in the digester. And on the outlet side, we then dry another sample, and we find it's only 3% total solids. So what, what that might look like is um, uh, we've got a, let's say we've got a liter of material or one kilogram of material of slurry on this side and uh, also on this side. If we weigh that before and after drying, we might find that uh, if this is 5% solids times 0.05, that means we've got about 50 grams of solid material on the inlet side. Uh, over here, we take one kilogram, which is also equal to 1,000 grams, sorry, uh, and we multiply that by 0.03, which is 3%. Now here we've only got 30 grams of solid material and the rest is water. So we lost 50 minus 30, we lost 20 grams of solids between here and there. Uh, now where did they go? What do you think? So it turns out they went off as biogas. Okay, so the gas that we took in and put in our big balloon, we got 20 grams of actual material as biogas. And uh, we can take the volume of biogas and using the ideal gas law, convert that to moles of gas, uh, and using uh, the molecular weights, we can convert that back to actual grams of, of uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that went up as biogas. You might be wondering how much to feed your digester. So if we have a continuous flow digester, we have to decide how much stuff we're going to put into it every day or every couple days. And so what we're looking at is what's called the loading rate or the feeding rate. So how much to feed? Well, to get there, we're going to use a, a formula called the hydraulic retention time. And hydraulic retention time, or HRT, typically is measured in days. So for a mesophilic digester, uh, engineers have figured out that uh, running at about 35 degrees Celsius, 100 and so degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the ideal amount of time to be in the digester is about 25 to 30 days. And what that does is it allows us to get the uh, maximum biogas out of our material before we start to get diminishing returns. So let's say we're going for 25 to 30 days. So the formula for HRT is the volume of the digester, and let's say we're going to look at that in liters, divided by the feeding rate or the flow rate. So for example, our small digesters that we have elsewhere in the video, those have a working volume of 7.5 liters. So let's say we're going for 25 days HRT. And that's going to equal our volume here, 7.5 liters, divided by x liters per day. 
a florid. That comes out to 0.3 liters per day, which is equal to 300 milliliters per day. What that gives us is 25 days of residence time in the digester for the microbes to take that fresh food and convert it into biogas and simple organic materials. If we really rush it and overfeed it too much, we can overstimulate the acetogenic microbes and uh, before the methanogenic microbes can, can catch up, we can get an acidic condition in the digester. So we can, again, that dreaded pH drop, which can cause the digester system to crash. The other thing that can happen if we really overfeed it is um, we can actually wash out our microbes and not allow them a chance to develop in the, in the community there. So it's best to try to target, at least from a basic design parameter, figure out what your feeding rate is gonna be per day and try to stick close to that. At our farm digester, uh, we figured out what the average feeding rate per day should be, and we only feed it two or three days a week, and so when we do that, we, we uh, stack them up. So we, we give it three days worth of feed uh, once, and then we wait three or four days, we feed it again with three days worth of, worth of feed. But that's based on the same formula of hydraulic retention time, the volume of the digester divided by uh, the flow rate. Hey everybody, now we're going to talk about how to build your own digester and uh, I think you'll see it's easier than you think. So for starters, if we were going to build a batch type digester, uh, what we use a lot of are these um, two and a half gallon uh, fork packs. We buy these from US Plastics. I think they're about 10 bucks each. Um, and so it's a really nice container. It's a two and a half gallons cube. Uh, it sits nice and flat. Um, and it's got this great cap that uh, we can take and uh, thread things into so we can uh, fit some plumbing in there. Um, I like these a lot better than the, the glass bottles that you saw earlier because the glass bottles tend to leak around the cork and stuff. So as you can imagine, in a small digester, we've got uh, you know, not a lot of gas being made. It's only a liter or two or three per day. And so uh, if we have any kind of a leak, uh, biogas is very patient and uh, it'll find its way out and so we won't be collecting biogas anymore. So, so making a batch digester out of one of these guys would be super easy. We just want to make sure that this port is nice and tight and then we're going to take the cap and knock out that centerpiece uh, like that, put a little hole in it and then we can just put in a gas fitting. So I would put some um, uh, thread tape on here and thread that guy in there nice and tight put my gas tube on here and now I've got a batch digester so I could load this thing with a seven and a half or eight liters of slurry uh, put it in a warm place and uh, hook a tube up to here and have gas start coming out within a day or two so to build a continuous flow type digester we're gonna end up with one of these and that's what I'm going to show you how to build today this one is a seven and a half liter digester uh, we've got the uh, loading end on this side and the effluent end on this side and our gas pipe on the top and we can take this guy and stir it uh, as you'll see elsewhere uh, to uh, do some mixing. So the key to making a digester is we've got to have some uh, airtight and watertight ports uh, to get our fluids in and out of it and uh, the really nice thing we're going to use today is what's called a uniseal. Uh, this uniseal is a rubber bushing uh, that's made for uh, PVC pipe so Later on, we're going to take a PVC pipe and we're going to jam it through this thing and it's going to swell and it's going to fill a hole in the side of our digester. Um, these are great. They're only, they cost about uh, two bucks a piece from, again, U.S. Plastics. They've got a great online website. Um, they come in different sizes. This happens to be a one-inch uniseal. I've measured and marked on the side of my digester uh, the same height as what's on my uh, other example. And I'm going to very carefully take my hole saw make my hole there. The next step is we're going to make my snorkels. So uh, I've got the, the part that's going to go up like that already cut and uh, I'm going to just go ahead and cut this one down. I want to do about a three inch piece here. Today I'm using a uh, PVC cutter which is super nice uh, so that these guys are handy. If you don't have one of these a um, 
a hacksaw works great too. But the nice thing about the PVC cutter is it's fast, it's accurate, and it doesn't leave a lot of burrs in the PVC. So uh, I'm going to glue up my snorkel. This is the uh, part on the loading side. If you're not familiar with glue and PVC, it's a two-part process. We've got a primer and a glue. The primer, uh, it helps to uh, prepare the plastic for the glue. So I'm going to put a thin coating of primer around there. If I'm careful, I won't make a mess and have a sloppy purpleness. Um, so I've got that. If you are sloppy, you get lots of purple on your uh, digester parts. It doesn't look as nice. And I want to also use primer on the uh, inside of my elbow. Not my elbow, but the elbow I'm gluing. So, a bit of primer there, primer there. Okay, I'm nicely primed all around. Be careful with your jars of glue and primer, you don't knock them over. The next step is going to be just a light coating of glue there and a light coating of glue inside the fitting. I take this, stick it together, and push and turn a little bit. And I want to hold that for, oh, say 15 to 20 seconds. If you're doing a bigger joint, you hold it for longer. Uh, otherwise, it'll push itself out. Okay, that should be good and solid. I'm going to take, again, my glue. Just a light coating on my prime down here. And stick it and turn. So I've taken the uh, end of the pipe and I've used a knife to um, just make it a little bit angled so it goes into the uniseal nice and easy. And uh, then I'm going to take some dish soap and put it around my uh, uniseal here. Great. Then we're just going to take this guy and if it all cooperates, it should jam in there nice and easy. Yes. That was the secret. So we tried this earlier without the dish soap and it uh, didn't go quite so well. Okay, that's that side. And then over here, take my other unit seal. Okay, now, got a cap. These caps we don't glue on, we just put them on there to uh, keep the, the guts inside when we're uh, not digesting. Not feeding, sorry. And we've got a digester. How about that? So uh, this is one example of a uh, floating gas collector that we built um, for research purposes. And what we can see here is I've got a uh, clear piece of PVC with a cap on the bottom. This is three inch. And then inside is a graduated cylinder. Um, you can see the graduated cylinder is floating on the water. And uh, what we've got here is a gas pipe that would go to our digester. Uh, and then we took a piece of copper, like uh, ice maker tubing, and uh, bent this with a tubing bender into a little snorkel. So the tubing goes up over the top, down in the bottom, and then it hooks up again to where uh, this copper pipe is sticking inside of uh, the floating graduated cylinder. As gas is bubbled out by the digester, it kind of bubbles up and it is caught by this graduated cylinder which is floating on water. That's, a, that's the gas trap. And we can measure by reading the level of the, the uh, gas in the graduated cylinder and comparing that between digester treatments. Now, <laughs> this is kind of expensive. Uh, this pipe, uh, this clear pipe is pretty pricey, and then we had to buy a bunch of graduated cylinders for this purpose. Uh, so, for um, and also they don't collect that much biogas. If we have a big digester, we're not going to be able to use this very effectively. So, our latest version is much larger, and for that we're just using PVC drain pipe. So I'm going to draw you a picture of that here on the board, so you understand how that works. We've got our digesters, our seven and a half liter digesters, and then we took a, a piece of six inch drain pipe uh, and these are um, 
And inside of that, I've got a piece of four inch drain pipe that's gonna be the gas collector. This guy has got water inside of it. Inside of there, I have a, a uh, three quarter inch pipe coming up just to the top of the water. Great, so inside of the uh, six inch drain pipe, uh, we've got a, a cap on the end uh, that's glued on there and then we passed a three quarter inch pipe through a uniseal at the bottom. So here at the bottom of my cap, I've got a uniseal just like we did with the digesters. Uh, and this has a T on it to uh, capture things. And then we've got a gas fitting here. So when gas is produced by the digester, it's going to push up uh, into this pipe and go up that way. And sitting on top of that, we have a... So, gas is captured under the four inch pipe, and as it's uh, gas is produced by the digester, the pipe is gonna float up. To be able to read it, we attach the meter stick to that. So, we've got a meter stick here. We can read from the side, like, where that level is. So, there you go. Making biogas at home or in the school or lab is really not that hard and uh, just takes a little bit of time and energy. Uh, and uh, we hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, send them to uh, farm at dickinson.edu. We'll get back to you. Take care.